There we go. Good morning, everybody. This is the Saturday morning Viper trading webinar. If you're here to learn about trading the futures markets using the Viper tools, you are absolutely in the right place. Today's topic is open Q&A. Bring all your trading questions. And we will do our best to answer all of them. First, we have to get through our standard disclaimer. Let's knock that out of the way. All communications from Viper trading systems are for educational purposes only. Futures trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or the webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody in here this morning does realize that you do trade at your own sole discretion. Okay, good. So today's uh, topic is, um, as I mentioned a second ago, uh, open Q&A. So with that being said... Let's get over here to uh, some charts and take some questions. So let's let's just start taking some questions here. Um, I, I'd like everybody uh, here this morning to, <clears throat> you know, we'll just take a minute or two here and just type in anything that's top of mind. Any issues, any questions, um, problems you might be facing, and let's just tick through them one by one. So just start typing in what your thoughts like. Uh, let me give you some some ideas. Um, I struggle with with retracements that go too far. Um, I always get beat up at the open. Uh, I have trouble trading band aids. Just anything, anything that you might be. Um, I have trouble because I miss uh, I miss a, a run sometimes and I can't get in. I'm just lobbing ideas out there. All right, let me have go here. We got some questions coming in. Um. One of the questions from Michael here coming in is uh, he's noticed that we, I think he's referring to Gary and I, have a very high win ratio. How do we do it? Okay, so high win ratio. Um, <clears throat> you know what I do to, to prompt some thought here? Uh, let me ask you some questions that might get some, some thinking going. Um, like here's an example. How many of you got beat up and whipsawed at the open yesterday? Let's go back to the open yesterday and let's look at Nasdaq. Anybody get a little whack-a-mole around in the morning first thing? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, here we got some questions coming in. Hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, here we got a lot of questions. Hold on a second. So, um, John is asking uh, the rules for the size of a good box. <clears throat> good box, bad box. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Dave H., what are the important signs of a trend starting? <clears throat> What are the important trend starting signs? Okay, trend starting signs. Okay, anything else? Uh, a couple more coming in here. Um, Adam got whacked on oil yesterday morning. Okay, yeah, it was oil was pretty choppy yesterday. We'll look at oil in a few minutes here. Okay, Adam. Mm. Here's a good one from OJ. <coughs> Stand by. Stand by one second. I'm take, making notes here. Um, okay. OJ's question is, apart from the American market trading session, what other trading sessions are those outside of the U.S. time zones? Okay. OJ, I can just give you a short answer, but we're going to look at those on some charts. That's a good idea. Um, we don't normally talk about that. Uh, uh, one would be the Asian session. Uh, that runs from about 5 to 6 Pacific time to midnight. And then, so we'll look at the Asian session, and we will look at the um, European session. <clears throat> European session runs from roughly midnight Pacific time 
uh, is when it begins. And so you get a lot of activities you can imagine in that first couple of three, four hours uh, until the U.S. market opens. And I think that runs until 8.30 a.m. Pacific. But then, of course, you have overlap with the uh, – with the. But, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, let's pull up some currencies in those sessions and look at them. I have some good ideas how we can, can talk about that. Um, more questions coming in here. <clears throat> Doug G, G saying I got all beat up yesterday morning and was trying to fight back all day until 3 Eastern to try to make it back yeah yeah let, let's talk about that let's talk about that Doug I know some people got whacked early in the morning and we're going to um, we're going to address that first thing that's to topic number one and then we'll get into all the questions okay uh, Adam says um, Are you talking about NASDAQ, Adam, on your question there, uh, comment? I was trying to notice the best pullback trade. By the way, b a bunch more people are coming in. Welcome, everybody. If you're just – I see a whole, more, more people are just, just signing in here. Uh, if you're just coming in, we're going through the questions. Hey, Ed. John, good to see you. Nasir, hey. I, I see you're coming in. A bunch of people. Hey, Walter, good morning. <clears throat> Uh, the, the part we're doing right now is uh, the Q, the Q part of the Q&A. Everybody is listing all their questions that they want us to address. We have high win ratio, size of a good box, trends, uh, uh, trend starting, signs changing, uh, and then uh, OJ brought up uh, talking about trading some sessions outside the U.S. sessions. Uh, any more questions? Let's see if we can get another question or two in, then we're going to get straight away into some charts here. Michael says, uh, stay in a runner as the price evolves. Shouldn't we be asking ourselves, would it be better to enter uh, a new position on a pullback? How much heat should we allow to take in a runner relative to the highest price attained? Um, that's a good one. Uh, that's a good one, Michael. It, it, that affects when you're in a runner, uh, where you put your, where you put your um, trailing stops and how you view getting in and out of trades. You know whether you break trades, long running trades into multiple trades, or whether you, um, because you're right. If if you have, if you, you we'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, let's do this. Let's get started. If you have any questions to um, to ask as we're going along here, just feel free to type them in. Anytime something pops in your mind, type in a question, and we'll talk about it. Let's talk about NASDAQ at the open yesterday. I want to. Uh, this is a really, really important topic that, that I think is. Uh, let's clean up this chart a little bit here. Take the predictor off. Um. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this because I think some people got whacked, and not only in here but in oil and and, and a couple other things. Here is 6.20, 6.25, so we're five minutes before, five to ten minutes before the open of the um, equities. This is NASDAQ. It was particularly choppy yesterday morning. And what is the first thing that we do when we pull up our charts and we're looking at the pre-market session? The first thing we do. What's the first thing? <clears throat> if you don't know the answer to this question, you're probably one of the people who got all whack-a-mole and beat up. So it's really good that we all pay attention to this because in the pre-market session before we start trading and do anything in regards to trading, if you don't do this one thing, you're going to be behind the eight ball right out of the gate because all the other professionals are doing it. Drawing lines on charts, exactly. Now I'm going to make this real simple, and it's not very complicated. You take one line, and you put a line at the top of where the market has traded as far as resistance is concerned, and that would be right up around here. And you put another, you could put a couple on NASDAQ, you know, more or less it was down in this area right here. Now you had some down here, <clears throat> excuse me, and you had one kind of here. So I've said this many, many times in other webinars, you don't have to, don't belabor 20 minutes over putting a couple lines on the charts, trying to be exact to, to you know, form fit it to some exact place. You know, just sort of eyeball it. You know, look for where a couple of swings hit. You know, more or less, more or less, there is support down in here. Okay, that's the way to look at it, right? <clears throat> 
Okay, we've done part number one. What's part number two? Part number two, I'll help you out real quick. In our mind's eye, we have to understand that as long as this market, and this could be any market that you're trading at the time, it could be gold, it could be crude, um, could be 6E. When you come in and you draw a set of lines like this at any time of the day, we all have to agree amongst ourselves that as long as the market remains within these lines, it is said to be in a range. Now, <clears throat> generally speaking, okay, and we need to remind, remember this, and this is going to help you from getting whack-a-mole in the future, is that as long as a market is in, the, is in a range like this, or, or, or let's do hypothetically, if it was even in a tighter range, let's do hypothetically like this. Let's do let's do a couple of lines here, okay? In the support area, let's 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 go like this. This is a pretty tight range here. Generally speaking, taking mid band trades, particularly when they are in the middle of a tight range like this, are not a good idea. Why is that? Why do we not want to necessarily look at taking mid band trades when we're in the middle of a range like this? Well, because <clears throat> let's just do a couple examples here and pretend that you're going to get filled out of a mid-range box. I'm getting slowing down here. I hope I don't, I hope Denja doesn't wig out on me here. Okay, by the time you get filled out of the mid-band box, how much room is there for your profit to make? Is there much room for profit here? No, exactly. No, John, Walter, PW, everybody. No, no, there's no room for profit here. By the time you get filled with a little bit of slippage and some commission, you're, you you got to get right back out or you got to scalp it and pray that it doesn't whip, come back in here and stop you out. Yeah, support and resistance is way too close, Doug. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you don't want to do this. This is how you're going to get whacked up in a range. The <clears throat> fact of the matter is we all understand that we should understand that if you're going to trade a range, you buy support at the bottom and you sell resistance at the top, depending on what the market direction is at the time. If the prevailing trend is down, you know, right now we're sideways, but if you come off of a downtrend, then we all know you're shorting the top, covering at the bottom, yes? We've covered that a thousand times, everybody, in webinars. If you haven't seen it, uh, we'll show you where to go look at uh, it. Uh, later on. If the prevailing trend is up going into the range, then your primary mode of entry is to buy support, take profits at the top. We try to avoid the middle because there's no meat on the bone here and it's prone to getting very stopped out. <clears throat> Let's move on. So here we go with NASDAQ, and let's all pay attention to this here, okay? P pause your questions, because this is the meat and the heart of what I wanted to cover first thing here, okay? Now here we go with NASDAQ. Here's 628. Here's 629. Here's 630. Here's 631. Okay, so where, where did the 631 Band-Aid paint on NASDAQ yesterday morning? Well, let's take a look. Probably right in here. Now, let me ask you a question on this 831, 631 Band-Aid. Was this a good Band-Aid to trade, yes or no? Was this a good Band-Aid to trade right here at 631 Pacific, yes or no? It's right here. Here it is, 631 Band-Aid. No. No. No, it's not a good Band-Aid to trade. Absolutamente not. I'm going to put a big X through this, and I want everybody to remember this, okay? If you get a Band-Aid paint, or you get a high energy time, or you get news, and it's painting a Band-Aid right and smack dab in the middle of a tight little 18-tick range, we absolutely do not trade it. The range trumps the Band-Aid, okay? I want everybody to remember this. The range trumps the Band-Aid. Now, if hypothetically you were in some kind of uptrend or downtrend and you got a nice pullback on a retracement 
and the and the Band-Aid paints at or near around the mid-band, yeah, that's a good Band-Aid to trade, yes? But in the middle of a tight range, it is not. We do not, we're going to, in the future, avoid doing that. Now, yesterday I pointed out the fact that we were in a range. Some people still got whacked. I got a little bit whacked. But I'm going to be explicitly clear at the opens from now on to address this issue. Okay? And uh, so if there's to, to avoid any further confusion about this. Let's move on. Here's 632. Now, here's a 632 Band-Aid. Right here. How about this one? Bips out down right here. We we getting short. We want to get short on 832. Here's 31. 31 still painting right here. Here's 32. How are you liking 32? Right here. Let's move on. What's the market doing here? What is Nasdaq doing right here? We well, can't get angry about it. You can't get upset about it. You can't take it because it's still in its range. Yeah, you're still in the sideways chop. Way back over here at 624, when we start looking at this chop, we, we drew these lines. We drew these lines. You can't say, the only thing I can say would be this, in all respect to everybody here today. If you did not draw these lines, it would be, it would be extremely difficult to try to see that chop and know what to do with it. I cannot emphasize how important these lines are to get on your chart first thing in the morning. It is the most important thing to your success that you can do in the morning to trade. Because you would have very immediately saw that you were confined within this range. And when 631 and 632 came along and you started to get all this melange here, it would have been abundantly clear to you that it was just whack a mole around here and to stay the heck out of it. Now, I know the other markets look very similar to this. I'm not going to belabor all morning on this, this topic, but I just want to drive this point home that when markets look like this and your boxes and band-aids are trading, this is really not even a place you want to box in. Getting back to um, John S.'s question. John, uh, John S.'s question was, I'm going to sort of periodically sprinkle answers in as they come along on the charts. The question was, definition of good box, bad box in relation to size of box. Let me show you a couple of boxes very quickly on this chart. This one here is a perfect example of a good one. They're going to want to be in the range of 8 to 10 to 12 ticks. We get over 12 ticks. 10 to 12 ticks is going to be your maximum size of a good box because then you're looking at more of a breakout trade. So here, for instance, you had support on this box just under the mid-band at uh, 75, and you had um, resistance at 76.50. So that's one and a half points on NASDAQ times uh, four ticks per point is six ticks. Let's look at an example of a not good box right here while we're on this uh, shifting gears very quickly to this topic. If you had to engulf an area and it looked as large as this, this is not a good box, okay? This is not a good box because number one size, bottom is at 76 and a quarter, so call it 76, and then the top, you know, is up here around 79 plus or minus. What is that, three, three and a half times four. You're looking at about 14 ticks on this box, more or less, depending on how you drew it. Yeah, this is too big. So just visually, you can see the difference between the size of a box like this, even though some of the candles are sitting right on the mid-band, okay, and the size of a box like this. I would even go so far as to say that a box this big is too big. And this big is too big. So I've got four boxes here to show you the size in relation to good and bad. Good is going to look like this. It's got to be like a tightly wound little spring with all the bars kind of right next to each other. Very clean top, clean discernible bottom. You know, all the candles are, are tightly packed. This is the spring we're looking for. This is what it is, okay? Think of this. It, when you get a box like this, it's kind of a loose coil. There's no compression here. See how loose it is? Candles all over the place. Box is real big. This becomes more of a head fake breakout type of box. You know, one more candle comes along. Oops, wrong wrong thing. Hold on. Okay. You're, you know, it's wicking around over here. You box it in. Next thing you know, 
Cano does this, you know, closes up here, you're filled long right here. You don't get any follow through. Never makes it up here. Next thing you know, boom, slams it right in your face and you get a full stop out. Yeah, in a case like NASDAQ yesterday, the open, John, uh, with your question there, you know, you really you really wanted to wait. You know, you, you really had two choices. I mean, your choices were wait until it gets up here and short it, wait until it gets down here and buy it. So, in effect, you're, in effect you're, you are trading that range. If you like trading ranges and you're good at it and you wanted to trade it, that would have been the prudent thing to do. Stay out of the middle where the Band-Aids were painting. And this doesn't always happen, okay? I mean, sometimes you get chop at the open, sometimes you don't. And I know it's tough because sometimes I can point out, I know two or three times yes, or last week, where the box is painted at 631, 632, and it took off like a bird and ran 80 ticks and hardly looked back. And so you're kicking yourself if you didn't get in because you're saying, well, my, holy cow, I missed that. How did I miss that? Well, I didn't take the box. But that was a case where uh, maybe I can try to locate these where, you know, it, it was already moving. Okay, it was already moving in a direction. It pulled back, and we happened to get a box right around the mid-band. So anyway, to finish this up about the boxes, 8 to 10 to 12 ticks. It's got to stay within that small, think of it as a tightly packed, coiled little spring ready to burst. If the box is much bigger than this, you really want to kind of avoid it. Okay, or use another tool, you know, like a line tool or something, or a ray tool, you know, something more like this. Not necessarily a box to look to get in. Any questions on that? Now, circling back to address Michael's question. Now, uh, in fact, I'm going to I'm going to sprinkle in some answers. To Michael's question is, how do we achieve a high win ratio? It's very very selective. Let me let me say it again. Very very selective on the trades. Now, when you're in the live room, it might seem like we're taking a lot of trades. Okay. Gary has his style with the Russell and the Crude, and we have the tools, and I have my style with the YM, NASDAQ, and occasionally I'll trade the Crude as well. And I'm just super duper selective. I'm, it may seem like I'm taking a lot of trades, but in reality I'm really not because I'm looking for those runners, and when I capitalize on the runners, you might notice that I get a little quiet. It's because I don't keep chasing it around. I'm looking to nail a big runner early. And then when I nail that big runner and I'm very well close or, you know, say half or three quarters away of the goal, I'm lightening up my trading. I'll put one or two on in a very, very selective location. Those of you who continue to press your luck and trade and trade and trade and trade and trade, you find that, and we had some comments earlier this morning about this very topic is, I got whack a mold early and then I got chased the market around all day. That was terrible. Well, it's because <laughs> maybe you're taking too many trades. Maybe you're looking at too many markets, and maybe you're taking too many trades. You've got to cut back the markets you trade and the number of trades you take and become very selective. Now, over here, of course, if you had bought the bottom of this range, you were already long. If you did box this in, which we don't recommend, but you did, you could have already been long. But if you were waiting, okay, if you were waiting and we get this breakout from the trading range, and you're sitting here at 636, what are we looking for now? Hardy, I'll circle back on that. I'm, I'm, I see your question about the, 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 the t template here. I'll, I'll circle back. I'm trying to stay focused on covering all these questions, okay? Thank you. PW, it really depends on the volatility. I mean, I'll tell you what, there's been mornings where I can only take, uh, I can only, I might take, you know, two, three trades. I might take two, three trades. I may, you know, in, in the cases where we had the early runners on those days last week, I, I, I can't, I maybe took two, three, four trades in a whole morning. That's it. You load it for bear, you let it run, and then you just nail it. And then you just either go to sim or just, or walk away, turn the machine off, go get some breakfast. People leave our room early in the morning all the time. Scores of people leave. It's seven o'clock in the morning, the first half an hour, they're done. That's really what you want to do. More questions coming in. Um, 
Yeah, you could have caught this down move here, John. No question about it. I mean, you know, the, the only thing I'm trying to show here on this 31, 32 box is, is that if you had engulfed them with a object trader region, there was a couple of instances where this might have whacked you right here, depending on if you had long or short enabled. Now, if you had short enabled only, you know, you would have gotten in, um, you know, the 32 box would have filled you short, you know, the 31 box would have filled here and then pro maybe stopped you out on that pullback and then the 32 buck of course filled you right here and you probably definitely got to stop out on that depending on which box here then you then you proceeded to get another short uh, the only thing you can do with these if you're going to do this is which we don't recommend doing in the first place but if you did you have to have your break even plus trigger on very like a hair trigger so if the market goes one or two ticks in your favor that you get your stop down. So here, let's do some hypotheticals on this chop here. So you're filled long on, I don't know, 31 box here. So you got maybe a couple of three, four, maybe five ticks on that. So you take your break even trigger on your object trader and your initial stop is say 12 ticks. So maybe it's sitting up here somewhere on your initial. And so after the market pops two ticks in your favor, and you set it for two ticks behind, then it immediately takes your, your, tra your, tra your stop to two ticks behind your entry. So in this case here, in these examples, if you had that break-even trigger on, break-even plus minus, then when it came back up to get you, it didn't get you a full 12 tick stop out. Okay, same up here. If you got filled short, uh, you know, on 31, 32 box, I don't know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe one of these, one of these over here, any one of those, or down here perhaps, you know, in one of these. Uh, candles coming out of that 32 box. If you had that break-even trigger on your 12 tick stop by then, it's sitting up here somewhere. You know, it pops down, gave you some ticks, maybe even hit a scalp, maybe even hit a scalper target, and then your break-even plus minus two is sitting down here like this. So boom, you don't get hurt. That's the way. If you're going to fight your way through that, you got to use that break-even plus minus trigger. Yeah, John, so here's the deal. You know, I may stay in the room until uh, 8 o'clock or, you know, 8, 10 or 15, whenever we wrap, and I may continue to call trades. But, you know, uh, I'm doing it for the benefit of the people who are in the room. Most of the time, some of the times, I'll say, well, I'm not taking that. I'm done for the day, but I'll stick around and I'll observe and call trades. That's for the benefit of everybody because there's people all over the world that come in our room at all manner of different times of the day right? Some will come in really early, they'll take a couple of trades, and they're gone. And you hear us say it too, good trading, way to go, you hit your goal, see you tomorrow, okay? Some people can't make it until later, they'll come in late. And so what I'm saying is that they'll miss all the early trades. So we have to stick around and continue to call trades even if we're done because there are people that are just coming in and they're starting to just look for trades. So that's why we do that. I mean, otherwise, we would just have the room open for, I don't know, 30 minutes, we'd nail a couple of winners and we'd shut it down at 7 o'clock. But all those people who would be coming in at 7.30 or 8 would miss all that and we'd have a 30-minute room. And of course, that makes no sense. Okay? All right. So let's let's look at this. I, I got a little sidetracked. My apologies. I wanted to really sort of finish the discussion on how to, you know, either, either you stand down in here or if you're going to trade the range, trade the range as we discussed or if for some reason you find yourself caught up in a range with these boxes, you know, the, your, your primary mode of defense is to get that break-even trigger to prevent getting whack a mold on head fakes. Everybody knows the break-even trigger plus minus, yes? In OT, anybody not know how that works? Break-even plus minus? I don't have the OT panel up in here, but there's a little, little part of the tool it has break even plus minus and you set that up it has a trigger on it and it has a plus minus I usually go anywhere from two to three ticks on the trigger and then I'll go two minus two on the on the move so it takes that 12 ticker 10 or 12 tick whatever your default initial stop is from your short entry here you know pops down and this is to prevent you getting whacked on head fakes you know it gets that stop down real tight so if you do get whacked you know, sometimes you'll hit a little, you know, you might hit the little scalper goal. So you got, you know, four, five, six ticks on this little scalper goal on the pop. And then your, your you know, your trigger gets you down here 
right by your entry. So in the end, you know, ideally, ideally the situation in Whack-a-Mole Town is, you know, you pop your six ticks on your on your short, you get your scalper, and then you take two tick hit on the retracement because it flips down here. Say for instance, you're filled down here. You know, you get a little bit of a scalper down here, and then you, you know, and you take a hit on the remaining contracts for two ticks. So in the end, you can either break even or make a few ticks. That's how you fight your way through that. Now, but anyway, back over here, and, and I'm gonna let's just get through this one, and then we'll get over some other charts because there's lots of other stuff. We got more questions and things to cover. So, so, so yeah. So I think I asked this question: What are we looking for here? The obvious answer is that now we've taken the top of this uh, uh, trading range out here. We need a pullback. The market has to retrace somewhere. We're not. We don't. Uh, we've covered this scores of times in other webinars. We do not chase thrust moves. When we get a breakout, we have to fight the tendency to chase it. Because just as you're getting in, all the patient professional traders who are waiting for pullbacks into support are going to be getting in when you're getting stopped out. So we never chase thrusts, right? So if this pulls back, if and when it was to pull back, where might it pull back to? <clears throat> Tell you what, let me show you a little more of it. Let me advance it another minute. I'll ask that same question. You're trading NASDAQ. It's 637. We're at 636. We're six, seven minutes into the market open. We've come out of the trading range here that it was stuck in all the way since pre-market. We've broken out. We pulled up, we pulled back a little bit, and we're putting in fresh swing highs. The market is, bands are stepping up. Background is green. Bars are primarily blue. We know we're looking for long trades. I'm going to not state the obvious. We're looking for pullback retracements to get long and buy this market. Where might the market come to if we were to anticipate where we're going to buy a bounce? By the way, I'm going to give you 15 seconds on that, 15 seconds to answer the question, where are you buying this market on a retracement? So there was a question, and I don't, I'm, I'm trying to cover as many of these can. There's a lot of questions coming in here. Um, you know, we'll, we'll try to be a little more explicit on the, on the box calls. I know a lot of times we just assume, Gary and I sometimes, that, um, you know, when we say box that in, and as an example over here, you know, anywhere where this happens, when we say box it in and a market is sitting and looking like this, we assume everybody knows to take your object trader box and draw a box like that, right? We're just, I mean, we're assuming, and maybe we shouldn't rightly assume this, but we're assuming that when we say box that in, it's sitting right on the mid band. We may have even called that level out before it even got there. A lot of times we'll do that. If it comes back into that 76 area and consolidates, I will box that in and take a long trade. So we're trying to be as clear and explicit as we can about these calls. You know, if for some reason they're confusing, what I want you to do is don't let two days go by and say, hey, you know, that uh, that Nasdaq trade you had at seven o'clock on Wednesday, what what was up with that? You, we've had 37 trades since then. I'm not, we're not going to remember what that is. What we want you to do is, if there's confusion at the time it's happening on when and where to get in these trades, I want everybody in here to agree that you're going to bring it up right at that minute. Okay? Don't wait an hour later after we've had 15 more trades and, and try to go back and address it. If you're confused when a call is happening on a trade setup. You need to bring it up right then and there, okay? Everybody, let's, let's all agree to do pinky swear we're going to do that. All right, so we all know that um, when markets retrace, I know a lot of you typed in mid-band. Of course, that would be right here around 76. There is a support level here. There is a little pocket of retracement support right in here. And so the sweet spot to get in is going to look like this. It can retrace a little bit shallow into here. It could come perfectly to the mid-band and sit on it, which is our ideal trade, 76. Or it could go a little deeper, perhaps dipping in towards 74. Okay? This is our strike zone. We're looking for old market Nazi here to throw us a ball right down the pike. And we're going to load up with our bat and smack that pup puppy out of the park. So what I'm saying, just to be clear about this, 
and this is what we have to do. For, for some of you, and, and I understand this, okay, it, it takes time to see and learn all this. We're totally understanding about that. But here's the thing. We can't, you know, sometimes I feel like it, it, uh, some, some traders, and I, I can't recall exactly who sometimes, but it, it, become more reactionary. In other words, I'm just going to, it, it's sort of a, an attitude like, well, I'm, a, I'm just going to see what the market does. When the market does something, then I'll take a trade, right? You're in reactionary mode. And I think what we're trying to teach everybody, and we have for years and years now, is you can't sit and be in reactionary mode and make money as a professional trader. You might get lucky here and there and nail a couple, okay, in reaction mode. The fact of the matter is, what we are teaching you is to be in preparatory mode, always. You're like a you're like a little spidey sense, okay? You've got your spidey. I draw the sweet spot zone not for entertainment. I'm drawing it because I'm mentally preparing myself to take a trade right here. So when the when the market presents me the opportunity, I am prepared to take it. I'm not going to react and wonder, oh, geez, I wonder where it's going to go. Well, you know, if it comes up in here or it goes over there, I don't know. I'll just kind of look and I'll, well, I'll see what happens. I'll just kind of see what happens. I'm telling you straight up, if you're trading in that mode, you're going to lose money. You're just going to flat lose money because the market is not built to deal with that. And it's going to whack a mole you all over the place. And if you're, if you're frustrated and losing money, that's probably part of it. You have to mentally prepare yourself for where this market could go and then get your tools and your spidey sense ready to step in and take a trade with some real money. All right, so let's look at what happens. We pull back, we're pulling back, we're pulling back, and where are these bars right now? Right here. Now, as you're observing this, I do want to make a point. This is a fluid market. It's not a static market. The market just doesn't sit there and wait for you to think what you're going to do. What I'm saying is this, is when the market moved up here like this, what did it do to the mid-band? Those of you who called out, well, I want to take a long in a mid-band. Does the mid-band just sit there waiting for you? To well, I'm a, a mid-band. I'll just sit there and wait till they figure out what they're going to do. No, it's a fluid condition. The mid-band has moved up here. So is our. So let me rephrase it in a different way. Is our sweet spot still here? No. The sweet spot's now here. Right? I mean, when, when the market was here, the sweet spot was down here. When the market moves up, the sweet spot goes up to here, yes? Yes, it's a moving strike zone. Unlike baseball or softball where you're standing at the plate and you're a static person and your strike zone is fixed, right? Right over the plate. In, the condi in market conditions, the fact of the matter is the sweet spot can move around, up and down a little bit. So you have to be prepared for that. When the market moves up here and the mid-band is up here, you can't be saying, well, you know, I'm going to wait until it gets down into here. You, you can't do that. The sweet spot's moved. It's up here now. Right? Isn't it? So when I ask the question, the bars have come down in here. Ahead of time, somebody in the room, Gary or myself, might have said, you know, I'll tell you what. If NASI pulls back anywhere down into that 77 area, or kind of around the mid-band, and bounces, I'm going to take a long. What does that mean? First of all, it means a number of things. We are preparing ourselves to take a trade in this area. That's physically what we're doing. We are preparing ourselves to take a trade in this area right here. We're not going to... We're not going to guesstimate and think about what's all going on and then you have several choices Gary likes the bar flip I'm turning on bar flip right here what does that mean that means when it touches this area and bounces and gets a bar flip he's in if I say if it comes down to 77 and find support down in there and get some consolidation I'm going to box it in and take a long longs only turn shorts off what does that mean that means it's sitting on 77, and I am boxing it in with long only enabled. And the reason I'm not upset, everybody, it might sound like I'm upset. What I'm trying to say is this, is that in the room, in real live market conditions, when the market's flying around all over the place, and we're making these comments, we're doing them, to, we're doing them because we're taking those trades with you, right? We're actually taking, you know, m m our primary mode of income is trading. We started Viper as a side business because we like the tools we built for ourselves. 
we wanted to share our tools so that others could become professional traders like we are. But most of the money I make for a living comes from trading, not from Viper, just so everybody's clear about that. So when I say that I'm going to buy something somewhere or I'm going to short something from somewhere, it's because I'm putting my own money on, real money on the line to make money from trading this. So, you know, when you make money and we make money or we take hits and you take hits, it's all real life stuff, okay? That's all real life stuff. We're not making this up. And so if you want to get in that professional trading mindset, you've got to step up to that level because there's hundreds and thousands of traders all over the world that you're competing against to make money. And they have is good and computers, algorithms, and, and companies and trading banks that have sophisticated algorithms, you are fighting with your tools against all these people to make money. And do you think they want to hand you money? No, they don't. They want to take your money. So if you're not prepared to do battle lot there, you're going to get whacked. Anyway, back to this. So we, we get filled long here, and we get a um, scalper target right here, and then it takes it out, and another runner gets engaged right here. Right here, depending on the tightness of your box, you, you, well, I don't think you got filled on that candle. You got filled more or less on this candle right here. You get a nice scalper target, and then your runner gets engaged, and up you go. You know, let's look at this one right here. Now, let's talk about stops. Who asked about the stops? Uh, who asked about the stops? Michael. So Michael's question was. Um, you know, do you, do you have to leave these loose stops, and, and how much money do you give back on 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 the uh, on the retracements on the stops? Let me let me talk about that for just one very quick second, because then I do want to shift to a couple other charts before we run out of time, and I do want to talk about uh, OJ's question about other trading. I want to get a couple currencies up here in the other trading zones. So listen, if you if you keep a tight stop. You know, most of you know I use a combination of the stealth and this kind of outer line here. Now, if you keep your stop too tight, every little pullback is going to take you out. Okay? I mean, that's why we say kind of loose stops and sort of tight stops is loose is going to be, I'll just debunk the mystery on this, loose is going to be down around the mid-band here. Okay? If you're following the mid-band, the loose stops are always going to be down here somewhere. So if you're saying to yourself, you know, I don't want to give back, 89.50 all the way down here to 84, 5, 24 ticks. I don't want to give 24 ticks back on my run. I would rather, uh, you know, truth be told, if I have a choice, I'd rather stop out up here, look for a mid-band bounce, and then retake it down here. I'm not going to give 24 ticks back. I want to bank my coin and look for re-entry. Well, you know, if you go a little too tight, what I'm trying to show you here is if you're if you're too tight, then the only way to do this is, and some of you might do this, is you're almost kind of scalping, right? You're getting in, you're getting out. You know, you're getting in, you're getting out. You're getting in, you're getting out. You're scalping it. So you're taking what could be one continuous trade of perhaps uh, 80 up here to 96, 16 times 4, 60 ticks, and you're punctuating it into maybe four trades that are maybe, you know, 10, 12 ticks each, 8, 10, 12 ticks each. You're getting in and you're scalping out, you know, three, four, five trades in the middle of what is actually a 60 tick run. For a trader with looser stops, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that would have been one continuous trade like that. 640, 639, 640 to around 7 o'clock, uh, 20 minutes in a trade, roughly, plus or minus, it had over 60 ticks. You put uh, 15 contracts on that, 60 times 4, you're at uh, $4,500. And as I recall, on Friday, that's uh, probably somewhere about what I made on that move, right there. Right there. Not quite halfway to the goal. 10K is my goal per day. One trade halfway to the goal. One shot right there. That right there. Loaded up 15 contracts, almost five grand. So people say, well I can't make any money trading NASDAQ. I can't make any money trading YM. It's only five dollars a tick. Well, you know, if you put twenty ticks on if twenty contracts, it's no longer five dollars a tick. It's a hundred dollars a tick. And when you move forty five ticks, you make forty five hundred dollars. That's called leverage in futures. That's how you make money trading futures. Through leverage. 
it's not the the instrument per se, right? Hold on one second, please. It's not the instrument per se, because each instrument is a little bit different. It's your ability to trade it that makes you money, right? It's your ability to trade it that makes money. You, some people in here might hate NASDAQ. You might look at NASDAQ and say, I can't stand that instrument. It, it, the retracements, I just can't take them. I like YM. I love the Russell. Crude is really good to me. And so you trade those. All I'm trying to say is that the setups for the trades are all the same. It doesn't matter what instrument you're looking at. You can make money at any instrument. The key is for you to develop the skill sets to become a master at that chosen instrument. And then forget the rest of it. All right, good. Sorry, I'm a little passionate this morning. Maybe I had too much oatmeal. Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to pause the screen. Let's get some other instruments done here. I don't want to spend all morning on this. Let's look at, uh, let's pull up 6E and 6B and some currencies, and let's look at the European and Asian trading sessions. Give me one second, please. This is very pat. Yeah, too much granola. Sorry about that, Walter. I'm all jacked up here this morning. My apologies, everybody. It might sound like I'm angry, but I'm not. I'm just uh, very passionate about this, most of you know. I'm very passionate about trading. I've been doing it a very long time, 22-plus years, and uh, just want to – very driven. want everybody to succeed doing this. All right, let's pull up a couple other charts. Hang in there. Yeah, passion's a good thing as long as it doesn't kill you, huh, Walter? Uh, Doug, in, in the in in the uh, well, John, let me circle back. Okay, we're getting some questions. Here, let me let me. Be, there was a couple. Of, I was I was just rambling on. My apologies. Uh, I was rambling on, uh, but there was. Let me let me circle back. I don't want to ignore your questions. My apologies. One second, please. And there was a question about position sizing and how I handle uh, 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 trades with multiple contracts and, and the uh, uh, appropriate times to, to apply leverage. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Doug, Doug and John have typed in, and from, and I'm summarizing and paraphrasing what their questions are. Okay, let me be explicitly clear about this, and I've covered this in other webinars, but I'll speak very quickly about it here. When a market is in a range and it looks like this, does everybody see this? I'm back on NASDAQ. I'm not going to spend a whole morning on NASDAQ. My apologies. But I do want to answer their questions. And, and, and I don't know, some of you may trade leverage or not. When market looks like this, is this the time to put 15 contracts on? Right here. And, I, you know, I have, maybe I haven't just explicitly addressed that So in terms of leverage and, and the application of leverage. Because, don't misunderstand, there are times when you should put 20 contracts on. And there's times when you just shouldn't. Is this a time when you're putting 15 contracts on? Right here. When the market looks like this, is this when you are loading the boat? I had a, a whole webinar dedicated to this topic, by the way. No. No. This is not load the boat time. We said that on the past half an hour. And the fact of the matter is, this may be no trade zone. Not only are you not putting 15 contracts on in here, you're not trading it. <laughs> and, and I spent all better part of a half an hour explaining why. You're avoiding the mid-band. You're avoiding the 31, 32 banditos. And if you were trading it, what did I say? You're buying support and selling resistance. I hope it didn't get all jammed up in the translation. That's what I said. You're buying support and you're selling resistance in the, if you're trading the range. You're avoiding the middle. If you don't like ranges and you're not good at it, you're not loading the boat and you're not trading it. Now, when the market breaks out and starts to trend like this and you get a retracement to the mid-band and you're only eight minutes into the trading session with good volume, is this time to start to load the boat? Yes. This is leverage time, folks. All right? And when I say leverage time, I don't mean go from trading one contract to start putting 15 on because you're going to exponentially increase your risk by a factor of 15. 
if you're struggling to make money with one or two, what do you th and you're losing money or scraping breaking even with one or two, what do you think 20 is going to do to you? You're going to lose money real fast. It took me years to build up to that point. So, you know, if, if you think you're going to come in in a few months or whatever and start throwing 20 contracts at something, it, I mean, you may have a huge trading account and you have the skills to do it. And if you do, don't misunderstand, absolutely do it. I mean, if you're ready to start leveraging up, what I'm saying is you start to build that direction. You go from one to two, you get pretty good at two. You go from two to three, you get pretty good at three. Now you're doing good. Okay, you're not losing too much. Your win rate's very high. You're being more selective on your entries. You're seeing chop. You're avoiding trading ranges. You don't get all whack a mold anymore. Now you put five on. There's a progression to it, right? Maybe after a couple of months of trading five, you feel pretty good. You bump it to six. You get a couple of hits. You don't like that. You step it back to four. So it's a progression. It's like learning anything, right? It's a progression. You just don't go from one to 15. It takes time to leverage yourself up, and of course, you have to have the, the you know, you have to have a good-sized account to trade that many contracts. Let's do an example. Let's say you're with a broker, and the um, margin requirement is $500 per contract, and you put 20 contracts on. How much capital do you need just to cover the margin? Do the math. 20 contracts, $500 a contract. 10 grand. You need 10 grand just to cover the margin, just to cover the margin on the trade, let alone to have any cushion. Now, let's suppose that you're trading um, two or three instruments. Let's suppose you have 20 open on NASDAQ and you have another 20 open on YM. How much margin do you need for that? Just to cover the trade. 20 grand. 20 grand just for that. And then, then you pop a 10 contract on oil. Now you're at 30 because that's 1,000 a contract. So you got 30 open contracts with $30,000. That's just to cover the margin. That's, that doesn't include any sort of slippage or, or buffering. Okay, so do the math. You know, t realistically, you should have 10 times that in your account to cover losses and, and all manner of problems like that. So it's all about leverage and, and how much capital you have to trade with. You know, it's all relative. If you have a modest account, you know, 10, 20, 50 grand, you know, you're, it, you, it, you wouldn't have enough margin to really cover all that to throw 20 contracts on it. That's why you got to stay at probably two or three or four or five until you have some more capital and you have the skill sets to, to, to take those moves. So it's all relative. Okay, that's all I'm saying. It's all relative. Did I answer everybody's questions? Can we move on to, uh, to the other topic at hand here, which is other trading times? Because some people have are overseas. I know some people are up in Canada. We've got a lot of folks in Australia and um, the Netherlands. Let me uh, let me bring up a different chart here. Uh, let me see if I can get 6B or 6E to uh, to load without crashing the system here. Just give me one second to load another chart. One second, please. All right, I've got 6B loaded here. PW, do you have a question? Okay, let's go back here. Um, uh, 6B. Okay, there's a question from OJ about some other time zones. Let's go back and, uh, and look at this here. So let me, explain, let me explain how this works. Most of you know this already. If you do, my apologies for the repetition. Um, uh, because there are some night owls that like to trade late and there are some folks that, you know, are at different time zones that have, you know, you have different trading uh, uh, times that you want to get in and out. So um, let's go through this real quick before we run out of time so we can address this issue. I know it's top of mind for many of you here. Um, in the Asian time zone, um, 
which starts up Asian time zone uh, is going to run from approximately, now adjust these times to your local time zone. From about 5 Pacific till around midnight it starts to run out of gas. Okay, so this is your Asian time zone right here. Where's midnight on here? Ah, there we go. Yeah, let me scrunch this up. So over in Asia, the Asian countries, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, the big financial uh, uh, areas, you know, they're trading um, uh, the Asian and European time zones. So you're going to be looking at this time zone here. This is late night U.S. So that you're looking at about 5 o'clock Pacific until about midnight is when the Asian session is. Okay, so you're going to be looking at trading um, 6J, which is the Japanese yen. Oh, wait a minute. Why? Do you, everybody see 6B? Everybody see 6B right now? Cursor moving. 6B, cursor moving around. Oh, okay, good. I, th I might have had a pause. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, everybody. Sorry about that. Okay, so back up. So what was I saying? Okay, so 5 o'clock Pacific time. Here again, if you're in the Midwest, that's 7 to midnight Pacific. Okay, that'd be 2 in the morning Central, um, is, the, is the Asian session. Okay, so you can look at all the currencies in here. You can see this is the Aussie, 6A, the Aussie, uh, 6J, the Japanese Yen. Um, you know, before you start getting into trading in the currencies, you want to double check the margin requirements with your broker. Make sure you have sufficient capital to trade those, especially if you're going to do multiples. These tend to move in the Asian session really well, 6A. And 6J, Japanese yen and the Aussie, and that's later in the day. Okay, so I'm not going to get into all manner of trades here, but you can see we had, you know, you had some short setups kind of right out of the gate here. Right, trend was down, a couple of retraces to the mid band, so you're shorting, re-enter, retrace, short, 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 short. This little run here could have made you coin right out of the gate on the Asian session on 6B right here. Ever since the Brexit, 6B has been moving really, really well. This whole move down, this could have, you could have made good coin on multiples on this. Look at this beautiful short, and then start to head up, chopped around a little bit, gets a deep retracement, and then you had a nice move up. So you get good movement in 6B in the Asian session going into Friday morning. Yes? Uh, PW, let me circle and answer that question. Uh, let me get through this whole uh, time zone issue, and then I'll circle and answer your question uh, before we close the room, okay? I see a very good question, and if, uh, what we'll do is we'll answer some questions before we wrap, PW. Um, but let me just get through this, okay? If I didn't answer your question, I will get to it at the very end. Just give me just give me a couple of minutes, and I'll get through these time zone questions, okay? And then we'll circle back. If I didn't get you, I'll stick around until we answer all your questions. So here's where, just real quick, all right, so the Asian session is wrapping up here around midnight, and now we're going into what's called the European session. So that opens around uh, midnight. Now, they're eight hours ahead of me. I think it's eight, eight and a half, nine hours. So they're, 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 this is their morning time in Europe. Okay, we're talking about England, London, you know, the European financial centers, uh, Germany, the DAX, FGBL, their bonds, you know, they're, they're the Bund. That's all trading now in the European session. So you're going to get a big spike in volume in 6E. This is all the uh, currencies, right? Here's 6E, the euro. If you're trading 4X, that would be the euro, US dollar cross pair. These all are futures versions of the, four, of the US dollar cross pairs. 6B is the futures version of the British pound USD cross pair. So now if you want to trade 4X, it would correspond roughly the same numbers approximately and the same exact price movement, only this is the futures version of that. So if you want to look into Forex, all of our, you know, Gary's called out many trades on 6B and different setups. They all work perfectly on Forex. 6S is the Swissy too. Um, you know, they all, they all have different tick values um, and they all have different margin requirements. Check with most brokers, it's $500 a contract for all your currencies. And then, of course, if you want to trade the flip side of it, you trade the DX, the U.S. dollar futures market, DX, $5 a tick. These are all September contracts, okay? $5 a tick 
on the dollar. Now, if you put a dollar chart up next to 6E, what are you going to see, for those of you that know currencies? If you put a dollar chart up right next to 6E, what are you going to see? What would you notice? What would it look like? 6E right next to the dollar. What relationship would those two instruments have to each other? Anybody? Look at this beautiful sell-off on 6B. Ever since the Brexit, this thing has been so volatile. Sometimes it's fast, though. Don't let 6B whack a mole you around. Don't go into the currencies and say, you know, just a word of caution. Some people say, oh, man, I'm going to go clean up on those currencies. And then you come in here, and you, what happens is the price action is different than you think, and you haven't learned the price action. You get smacked around. Don't let that happen. Go in and learn how that moves. You might not like 6B. Maybe you like 6E. Complete inverse relationship. Correct. Here, I, maybe I can get that up real quick. I hope I don't crash at the last minute here. If I crash, we'll have to wrap. 6E. And let's see if I can get a dollar chart. Now, if you're going to trade 6E in the dollar, uh, Hardy, I have looked at the bonds futures. I looked at ZB and ZN. By the way, the largest volume contract in futures, of course, everybody knows the E-mini S&P, ES, um, uh, in terms of dollar volume, uh, or, or I'm sorry, contract trading volume is, uh, is, uh, is ES. Right, right next to it, right behind it is ZB and ZN. That's the bonds and the notes, the 10-year note futures. Uh, are huge, but they, it's really slow movement. You talk about a snail pace movement. Oh my good gosh! <laughs> you can you can go to sleep trading ZN. Let me just put it that way. Wake up a half an hour later and it moved four ticks. So that's why I don't trade it anymore. Okay, here's the dollar. Stand by. I'm going to compress the chart. Give me one second, please, and I hope we're not going to crash here. One second, I'll get it up. Hold on. All right, here's the dollar, and here is 6E. Put putting them right next to each other, inverse relationship. Now, the reason I say that is that if you're going to trade these two futures instruments or cross pairs, uh, sometimes, one moves, move, sometimes one will move ahead of the other, giving you a heads up on a trade on another one. In other words, when you put these two, so what is this? Looks like looking in a looking in the looking glass mirror here a little bit, right? Here, let me see if I can get them lined up a little bit better. They're not lined up too perfectly just yet. There we go. Uh, so just real quick to show this, and, and if you're going to trade these two, I really urge to at least have these two charts, and then trade one or the other or both. But essentially, this move down here on 6E more or less equates to this move up on the dollar. If you go study it later and put these charts next to each other, um, you know, those two are complete mirror opposites of each other. Um, and what I was saying was, just like other instruments, you're going to find that that each of them has their own personalities, okay? Notice on some of these retracements on, on the dollar, for instance, we used to have these two in the room. Anybody remember that years ago? Um, what I'm saying is that look look at certain areas where you get retraces. These Sometimes dollar really respects the mid-band. might be a little easier volatility-wise to trade, whereas, you know, sometimes the dollar can get, I mean, 6E can get a little spiky. See in here? If you don't like spikiness and you don't like coming above and beyond the mid-band with some big thrusting spikes, then you're going to gravitate more towards the dollar. You're going to have a little bit smoother movement than 6E, whereas 6E can get a little more spiky. But it's good to watch them two together because what will happen is if you trade in the dollar and 6E starts to move in a certain direction, you pretty much can be assured, oh, that's right, Hardy, you're a heavy, heavy dollar trader. I forgot about that. Um, they're not both $5. Um, uh, the dollar is uh, uh, is five dollars a tick, and this I believe is twelve. I haven't traded in a long time. I think it's twelve and a quarter a tick on six E. I know it's twice as much. I haven't traded it in a very long time. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recorder. I think we're pretty much done here. Um,